Great to be here. Hi, everybody. As Charlie said, I'm managing partner at Fabric Ventures and been thrilled to, to working with uh, Cogex for a number of years now, in particular on the Web3 side of things. And so we're going to um, uh, delve into um, some of the new concepts and new tools that have been created um, in Web3. Um, and, but before we do that, um, I think I'd like to you know, bring on to the stage, as it were, uh, the two speakers for today. Um, first of all, we have uh, Rune Christensen. Hello. And we also have Luis Quende. Hey, everyone. And I'm glad we all pretty much got the kind of black the black T-shirt memo. That's good. Um, in keeping with the um, you know, kind of the developer centric uh, um, uh, area that we operate in. So um, I I'm going to start by sort of teeing up the discussion a little bit um, by just a small definition of what society actually is, and then. Um, you know, I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves and give you a chance to do that. And then we'll expand upon the, the inventions, actually, that, you know, you uh, and your organizations have created that we think are pretty fundamental, actually, to society. So if you go and uh, look in, um, actually, in Oxford published um, a, a dictionary at the definition of society, it's, it says that it's an aggregate of people living together in a more or less ordered community. Uh, perhaps dealing with things like drugs, crime, and other dangers to society. Um, so um, I think th these days we might emphasize the more or less bit of that particular statement, um, perhaps suggesting that indeed we can think about how to improve on society. Now, the second definition of society they have there is an organizational club formed for a particular purpose or activity. So I think this gets to something that we might uh, to talk about during today, which is the differences between societies that are organized from the top down and societies that are organized and you know from the bottom up. Um, so without further ado, a little bit more background to um, first of all you, Rune. Um, you know, you have uh, hailed from Denmark, um, was teaching English and uh, building a business in China back in the uh, uh, the golden age, should we say, um, and then founded MakerDAO. Um, and that is, and we're gonna get into it. Um, and a project that has produced what is known as a stable coin, something whose value remains stable with respect to a commonly accepted currency today, that is the US dollar. Um, and there's about $130 million worth, if I'm correct, currently in circulation. And many hundreds of different projects are incorporating that technology into what they do uh, in this new coming wave of decentralized computing. Um, so in a second, I'm going to ask you to expand. But first, uh, Lewis, you have been uh, hacking since the age of 15 and indeed winning competitions and indeed building companies since the age of 15. And the organization you founded was Aragon. Um, and A Aragon is creating tools that actually give other people the, um, the ability to organize themselves in entirely new ways, in a new decentralized way with levels of autonomy in the way decisions are, uh, are made. And so again, we're going to dig into that, but you've also got um, a community of many thousands of people who uh, are building such uh, new forms of organ or, you know, automated and autonomous organizations, but we'll dig into that. So, so with that, I'll go back, to, go back to Rune. Do you want to give us a little bit more of um, the genesis story of how you came into this space and how you created MakerDAO and uh, indeed talk, talk to us about uh, stable coins? Right, so I got into blockchain and crypto originally with Bitcoin all the way back in 2011. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people are really drawn into Bitcoin because of this, the autonomous nature of the system, right? That this was a, a, a currency system that existed completely independently from governments or state actors or companies and so on. But the problem with Bitcoin, as it became clear to me once I started uh, buying some, is that it's super volatile, right? And you can you can gain a lot of value from it. You can also lose a lot of value very quickly. And because of that experience of, of uh, you know, my own experience with that volatility, I realized that you need a stable version of Bitcoin, right? You need cryptocurrency that has these incredible qualities of the blockchain, um, but also maintains the very important a characteristic of traditional finance, which is stability and reliability. So that's um, what brought me to to start MakerDAO, which is um, 
yeah, like you said, it's a platform creating a stablecoin called the DAI stablecoin that's worth one dollar. But I think what's really important to highlight is that it's a completely unbiased and community-run protocol that controls all of this, right? So it's not a company, it's not a custodian. It's actually a computer program that's able to maintain the stability of, a, of a, this stablecoin and then also provide um, a platform for open finance that is then uh, completely permissionless and gives equal access to anyone regardless of where they are in the world. And today we're mostly seeing traction in South America. That's, that's where there seems to be a really a lot of, of interest in this kind of product, mainly because um, there's a lot of places down there with, with um, hyperinflation. Argentina is, is the perfect example, right, where there's something like 50% inflation per year in their local currency. So people really like to uh, have access to the US dollar and, and use dollar bills a lot in the gray markets. And that's where giving, you know, Argentinians trying to escape inflation access to a digital form of the dollar is just incredibly powerful because that means they're no longer sort of pushed to the fringes of the, of the global financial system, right? Where they are only able to cons- transact with paper currency, for instance. But actually also has that digital access, that, um, you know, global access uh, that, that people in the, you know, in Western countries, the, the most privileged people in the world, they have this same kind of access today. Uh, and that's what we're all about with MakerDAO, is trying to, to take that and make, you know, create an equal access to the full power of the financial system for the whole world. Thanks, Rune. And um, I'd like to come back to you in a second and talk about what I think is even more fundamental and exciting than that, which is the way in which you can take a stable coin and, as you said, um, incorporate it in new applications in the open decentralized finance system. But So we'll come back to that. But, but Lewis, over to you. Maybe uh, if you can, uh, do, I'm sure, do a better job than me in explaining, you know, why and what um, um, you're doing at Aragon. Yeah, so uh, I also got into Bitcoin in, in 2011. I think that was a, a good year definitely for getting a bunch of people into the space, uh, but it feels like the kind of like dinosaur's age. Like when you talk about uh, 2011 in the crypto ecosystem, it seems like um, ages ago. But um, the reason I got in is because the uh, the crisis, the economic crisis that hit in 2008 was actually very bad for uh, the country that um, I'm from, Spain. And a bunch of families just had um, basically to um, to sell their soul to banks forever after that crisis. And my family was one of them. And from a very young age, I think I was 15 or 16, seeing my family and tons of others enslaved to banks forever was something that I just couldn't swallow. And so uh, I saw Bitcoin as an alternative to the system. I wasn't exactly sure of how Bitcoin could free these people, but um, I saw potential in it. And then the the thing that I realized about Bitcoin is that like Bitcoin is one very important piece, but there is uh, apart from the financial piece, from like the kind of like free open source money, uh, we also need tools to organize, and so that is kind of the next step in what we are building at Aragon: tools for people to organize in a decentralized way. So basically, you can think about Bitcoin as this kind of like free um, open source money, and you can think about Aragon as kind of the platform for like uh, free open source governance and. One of the points in which um, we started actually thinking strongly that Aragon was needed in the world was in 2016. My co-founder and me were working on a Silicon Valley or creating a Silicon Valley uh, startup, like basically, you know, going the traditional route, uh, trying to raise from VCs. And at some point in, I think, November or October 2016, Donald Trump won the elections. And from that point on, it became very clear that governance in the world is just not working at all and that we need new tools to organize. Great. Thanks, Lewis. So, Ruin, maybe um, you know, back to this question of stable coins and, and this um, new decentralized finance system. Could you explain to people you know, who, who perhaps have not actually even looked at this area um, you know, what is the point in decentralizing finance? What are the what are the benefits to, I mean, ultimately the people, I guess, who are receiving finance and to society? So I really think that this is where um, the blockchain and then open finance and this whole new wave of technology is 
very unique in, in how it's provided. Like, it's not so much what the benefits are, but it's more who gets those benefits. Because if you look at earlier waves of technology in the past and industrial revolutions and so on, it's typically always been um, the elites already and sort of the people who already had a lot of resources who would reap the majority of the benefit of, of this new technology. And those who were sort of at the edges of society would maybe not even see any benefit at all uh, because they just didn't have the access to, to sort of grab the opportunity. And the blockchain and open finance is, is actually uniquely completely the opposite of that. So it's really that um, it provides all of its benefits equally to everyone in the whole world, regardless of, um, you know, whether you're able to, I don't know, get an account with a bank or pass a KYC um, test, right? Or whether you have a, an official ID from your government. And, and there's actually a lot of people like that around the world, right? Once you look outside of the, the Western countries, there's, I mean, just globally, there's 1.7 billion people that don't even have a bank account today, right? And there's even more that are financially underserved. So they, they may have access to savings or something like that, but they don't really have access to more advanced financial tools. And um, I mean, access to finance is just, I mean, it's, it's been established by, um, you know, the, the UN, for instance, it's like this is a, a fundamental a resource that, that all humans should have, have the ability to access, right? Because it means so much for how you're able to improve your own, um, you know, your own life. Uh, and, and, and again, that's what's amazing about the blockchain is because everyone can access this directly from your phone, right? It's possible today for someone in Argentina, again, as an example, right, to just download an, an app on their phone and through that immediately have access to, um, to, to digital US dollars through the DAI stablecoin that they can then send anywhere in the world instantly for low fees um, without, again, requiring to, to go through any sort of official check or, or similar, right? But simply just get that direct equal access. And that allows, again, anyone to, um, to, to access these tools and then use them to, to you know, for their business or for, for savings or whatever it is that they, they need them for, um, which I think will have a big impact on, uh, I mean, financial inclusion, obviously, but then also improving quality. Yeah, so, and, and, and beyond access, I, I guess there are some interesting statistics about you know, the debasement of the dollar in the last century, arguably close to kind of 99% or so in the last uh, 100 years. Um, the fact that um, the way in which uh, central banks choose to um, allow money to, to trickle into the economy um, has in part led to, you know, the top 1% in the last 30 years becoming $30 trillion uh, more wealthy and the bottom 50% becoming $1 trillion, $1 trillion less wealthy. Um, and one, one thing I came, came across the other day, which was pretty astonishing, is that, you know, in the last decade, all four of the major central banks, um, you, know, you know, European, um, US, Japan and China, have um, actually inflated their balance sheets by a factor of seven from one to seven trillion. And of course, that's accelerated just, just recently. Um, and uh, so anybody who believes that um, uh, the current... Uh, currencies that we rely upon for global trade are going to re retain their value forever and a good place to park um, uh, your life savings. Um, should really be thinking about that again. And maybe we'll come back to that. I'm going to ask the question of when, when do we think that actually the global reserve currency will switch from where it is today to being a decentralized uh, stable coin. Um, so, Lewis, back, back, to, back to you and this question of... Um, uh, organizations, maybe you can give an example of uh, the use of the tools that you've built at Aragon, the, the type of situations where you can um, uh, solve problems that uh, are challenging uh, without the tools. Yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, the technology is extremely early and it builds on other technology, like, for example, without with a DAI uh, or with our stable coins, like we couldn't do what we're doing. But there are some examples today, like there is this uh, virtual world, basically like something very similar to um, like Ready Player One, which is like this movie where like they just go into a virtual world and they kind of like live there. Um, and so you have this virtual world when you have like kind of like pieces of land or virtual land that you can build whatever you want. And then people go in there and they like game, game meet, um, like the, uh, the whole kind of coronavirus trend has made it actually like kind of gain traction. And so the the community uh, that runs that virtual world uses Aragon, 
And so you are going to basically govern that virtual world. So like it's a virtual world that is fully decentralized and controlled by its users. So that's something that is live today. Um, it's a multi-million dollar economy. Um, but there are other use cases that I'm excited about that we haven't really seen in the wild. I think one of them is UBI. Like with these, people can get together and they can provide universal basic income for their groups of people uh, that they care about for their family and stuff like that without necessarily relying on like a nation state um, to, to do that. They can just go together, have this like shared internet piggy bank and decide how to um, allocate those resources in their community. So I think community um, or like kind of grassroots um, use cases are the things that really excite me. And so like to, to, to step through that, um, so a set of people would get together um, can we uh, think of a, an example? Um, is it just in times of crisis that people get together to you know, direct the funds in that way? Or is it uh, more generally? Um, and then, so they get together and they, they build a, a DAO, a, a DAO, you know, decentralized autonomous organization to make the decisions or codify how the decisions for allocation are made. And then would they distribute those funds in a stable coin, in fact? Is that kind of one of the connections between these two technologies? Yeah, exactly. Uh, definitely. I mean, digital organizations or purely decentralized organizations need uh, assets that are stable. Otherwise, like it's just very hard to for them to operate. Yeah. Got it. Rune, Rune um, um, this combination of a kind of a fairer and more transparent and codified, um, well, I, I guess it's one step short of justice, maybe, but at least it's, you know, governance. Um, uh, and with you know the power of a stable coin, uh, you know, what are your views on um, uh, the, the future for that and the, um, the the significance of UBI? I mean, we've effectively seen UBI uh, be deployed, um, even though there's a Republican government in place in the US. In the face of this crisis, they've had no uh, choice but to start distributing. I think it's a, a thousand and a half or twelve hundred bucks or something like that to to everybody. What are the would be the advantages of trying to do that? with a stable coin. Yeah, I mean, well, so um, a dis like blockchain based currency and digital currency is obviously always going to be better for what you would call programmatic uh, behavior, or, you know, sending money to a lot of people automatically and ensuring that they arrive exactly when they should arrive, and that, you know, don't disappear into, you know, some corrupt officials pocket or similar, right? That's, that's the type of situation where um, stable coins really excel because of the power of the blockchain, right? This complete transparency, complete, um, you know, security of the underlying platform, uh, but also the programmability. So you can simply create a system like this uh, quite, quite easily using stable coins. Um, and I also think on, on top of that, another thing that's also really important is that, you know, when you think about UBI and you think about, um, you know, giving people equal access to, to um, welfare and funds and so on. It really is, again, about this. I mean, it is about equality, right? It is about making sure that you treat everyone fairly. So that's also where I think that financial inclusion and the tools that you would automatically get, you know, if you receive your UBI in a decentralized stable coin like DAI, itself is also going to be, a, you know, a, a powerful part of it, right? It's... Like welfare itself isn't enough. It's also about giving people tools to then um, take that UBI, for instance, and use it to to improve their own life, right? And that would be, for instance, getting access to to um, savings, right? Through um, which is something that decentralized stablecoins enable you to do. So, so again, if you take the example of of, of our users in Argentina, um, uh, using the the Dai stablecoin, that's the only way that they're able to receive. Um, you know, an interest rate on USD-based deposits, because obviously you can't get an interest rate on US dollar bills, physical dollar bills, right? But you can uh, take a digital dollar and then lend it out on a on a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, for instance, and get a small, but, you know, but reasonable return. That's actually a big difference for someone who otherwise is just totally cut off from the financial system. Um, and I think only on to sort of compare this or bring it back to, to, to Aragon, um, what's interesting again is that the reason why Maker is able to offer this uh, decentralized stablecoin, right, and this kind of unbiased currency platform is because just like Aragon, it's also a, a DAO, right? It's also a, a platform that's not controlled by a company or custodian or government or even a legal system. 
um, it's it's an autonomous computer program that runs on the blockchain and is then governed by the community, which, to your point, um, is I mean it, I would say it, it gives a, it creates better conditions for things like economic justice, right? Because you have the community itself setting the rules and policing the the implementation uh, of the you know of the monetary platform itself, right? Which is yeah, like again to the point about central banks uh, expanding the balance sheets and so on, right? Like I think a lot of people ask them who really benefits from that, right? And uh, and also I think many would, would believe that that's it's typically more the big corporations and those with regulatory capture that gets to see the big benefit and maybe not so much uh, the regular people. And that's where I think unbiased systems like DAOs and stable coins are really going to be the key to try to to fix this. So there's a really interesting um, sort of couple of points here, which is that if you're going to obviously give uh, people a uh, universal basic income effectively for being citizens, you can get into this question of defining and codifying even what it means to be a citizen or to be a good citizen. Um, it also, I think, connects to you know what uh, Tony Blair was proposing yesterday around uh, digital ID, because obviously you probably need a digital ID for the people to distribute those stable coins to them. Um, so without, I mean, by all means, actually, if you want to get into defining what a good citizen is, we can do that. But that you can also think about that governance process, that decision-making process in the context of loans. And, and as you said, Rune, you know, you know, we've seen that that's um, starting to happen now in the decentralized finance world. People are taking, should we say, real world um, assets like invoices and using them as collateral for getting loans in, in, in your stable coin, in fact, and not yours, in make it how stable coin, coin die, uh, and then using that to help run their business uh, businesses better. So, um, uh, so by all means, comment on the citizen side as we kind of you know screech to the, through the last sort of five minutes, or uh, indeed about the decision making about you know loans, where hopefully it means we can move to a world where you know you don't need to know your bank manager. But um, Lewis, you, I'm curious also this whole question about um, sort of fact checking. Um, in so, in social media or in whatever the kind of aggregate of media is becoming in the future, do you think decentralized autonomous organizations have a role in trying to bring us to some kind of consensus as to what, um, or much better consensus as to what the truth is? If we can do that more automatically, hopefully we can do that more pervasively across across media. Do you think there's a role for DAOs in getting in achieving that at some point? Yeah, definitely. I, I wrote this post called Expert DAOs, and basically the idea is that you're able to pull in some experts, and these experts can cryptographically attest some truth. And so and there's a lot of value in that in kind of a coronavirus times, for example, because just kind of fake news are like rampant, they are everywhere. And so just having that like um, entity that can cryptographically attest something via its members doing doing the same, cryptographically attesting truth, I think has a lot of value. And with crypto economic systems, you can even have them have a stake, have some skin in the game when they attest it. Um, and then if you put in something like a decentralized arbitrator or a decentralized kind of mediator or, or uh, entity that can do dispute resolution, then you can actually end up with a system that can do fact checking uh, and that can seek truth in a much better way. Actually, the, um, the way Facebook has been dealing with this, they, they used to spend $130 million to create kind of like a moderation court. It's obviously 100% decentralized and it's like run by Facebook. And we've been doing the same, but instead of a centralized entity, we're creating a decentralized protocol for this pure solution. So these communities, these DAOs can actually use that service to basically uh, take disputes and resolve them in a very efficient way, which I'm super excited about because it really makes, um, I think, fairness and justice be cheaper and faster than in the traditional world. Absolutely. I think that is pretty fundamental to the debate that is reverberating around pretty much every media channel currently. Rune, do, do, is there anything further you want to talk about on the, maybe back on that question of uh, defining citizenship or, or indeed maybe the, this question of, you know, loans um, within the, the decentralized finance system? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think when it comes to something like defining citizenship or, or I mean, which is, Maybe you would call that a you know a governance question um, or some sort of implementation question of UBI, for instance. And the perspective we take on on the 
all of the like all of those issues as we build the make it up platform is really that um open finance and platforms like make it are meant to be the infrastructure layer right so it's the it's the low level where uh, the best possible tools are created to enable transparent, secure, efficient, permissionless finance. And then you could have a community, you know, on top of that, implement whatever, um, you know, requirement for citizenship to distribute UBI, for instance, that we want to do. Or generally just have people build a lot of businesses and projects and, and really take these tools and do whatever they want with them. I guess because nation could, could compete to define different criteria for good citizenship and then people can choose where they want to be. Yeah, absolutely, right. It's always all about, um, I mean, this is what blockchain is all about, right? It's about creating tools that enable people to, to, to do the innovation that works for them and really try out many different solutions. So, so unfortunately, and I could have predicted this is the case, we're beginning to scratch through the surface here and there's many more uh, questions to delve into. Um, uh, I think, look, we've seen a way in which we can have better and fairer money and better and fairer decision making and also do that in a way that allows the kind of the rules, should we say, to bubble up from the, you know, the bottom to sort of this emergent way uh, of approaching uh, governance. So I think that's pretty exciting. And thank you so much uh, to Lewis and to Rune. We are going to have a QA and a in uh, half an hour. Um, so um, I would invite the audience to contribute to those questions and hopefully we'll be able to tackle them in yet more detail. Thanks very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Rune. Uh, that was a brilliant session and that's going to wrap it up here on the leadership stage. Don't forget, as Richard said, pop into the breakout Q&A and get your questions answered. You can do that by joining the app and asking them there and Richard will try and get through as many as, many as he can. Um, we're going to be back soon, but uh, that's it for now. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.